All right, thank you for coming. My name is Norton Mizvinsky, and I'm the president of the International Council for Middle East Studies. And uh, as you know, the program today uh, is going to deal with Iran and Israel. Um, to what extent is Iran a security threat for the state of Israel? And then, of course, uh, the secondary question is um, <laughs> something like, uh, uh, should uh, any Western military intervention uh, be expected uh, in regard to Iran? Now, um, our uh, two speakers today are Ehud Elam, who specializes in Israel's national strategy and defense. He has been involved in the study of those subjects academically and politically for more than 20 years. He has a PhD and is a former private contractor for the Israeli Ministry of Defense, uh, where among other duties, he conducted research in different areas of, Israeli of the Israeli military and served as an academic instructor at the Israeli Defense Forces Command College. He is presently a visiting fellow here in Washington at JINSA and a contributor to and representative in the U.S. of the Israeli Defense Magazine. Our other speaker is Trita Parsi on my left who acquired his PhD from and is taught at the Johns Hopkins University uh, School of Advanced International Studies. He's the author of Treacherous Alliance, The Secret Dealings of Iran, Israel, and the United States. And on the basis of that book, um, he was awarded, uh, the, he was awarded uh, uh, made two major awards for scholarly e e excellence. He was the recipient of the Council on Foreign Relations 2008 Arthur Ross Silver Medallion Award. He was also the recipient of the Consul on Foreign Relations 2010 uh, Gravermore Award for Ideas Improving World Order. His most recent book, A Single Roll of Dice, Obama's Diplomacy with, Ir with Iran, was uh, just recently published in 2012. Trita Parsi is additionally the president of the largest Iranian-American organization in the United States, the National Iranian Council. He is frequently interviewed on television, and as many of you know, and as many of you know, cited widely in major newspapers and other publications. His articles on Iran and United States-Iranian relations often appear in numerous journals and periodicals. Uh, now, uh, uh, Ehud is going to speak first, uh, Trita will, of course, speak after Ehud, and then uh, we'll definitely have uh, a question and answer period. Um, you'll be able to make comments, but uh, we'll try to limit comments uh, to about one minute. Uh, but we'll get to that when we get to that. Uh, we have two um, very able speakers to speak to this most important topic. Let me say again that the International Council for Middle East Studies is more than pleased. Uh, to uh, have this session, which is really just part of, of the series of sessions that we have planned for this year, 2012. So now, without further, further ado, I'll turn it over to Ehud. Thank you very much, Norton. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, first of all, I want to make clear that what I'm saying here is my own uh, private uh, views, and they are not necessarily reflect the opinions of anyone or any institute, especially in Israel. Also, when I will refer to the Israeli nuclear weapons, I'm basing that on non-Israeli sources. Okay? Well, I'm going to focus about the Israeli perspective about Iran as a threat to Israel. Uh, first of all, uh, what are the Israelis might think about uh, Iran as a threat? You know, there's almost uh, 6 million Jews in Israel. It means 12 million opinions in a good day. So. <laughs> I'm not going to cover all those opinions, but I'm going to start with the basic. First of all, the conflict, the Iranian-Israeli conflict, it's completely unnecessary because there is no real reason for dispute between those two countries. You can see they are far away, more than 1,000 miles between them. There is no disputes about lands, about water. Like, it's not like the Israelis and the Arabs, especially you can compare it if this is Iran and Israel. These are the Arabs in Israel, this is Israel and the Palestinians. They are together, they are stuck with each other, like in a very bad marriage, they are not going anywhere. But Iran and Israel are completely apart, 
And from the 50s to the late 70s, there was some kind of alliance between Israel and Iran. They even had all kinds of projects during the 70s. They fought even to produce a fighter together. So today it sounds uh, ironically, but still. Um, so there is no real dispute between those two states. Um, but there is kind of an Iranian threat, at least uh, in the future, on Israel. I will start with the possible conventional threat, which right now it's quite minor. Because since there is such a gap between those two countries, there is no possibility of a conventional war between those two states. Um, right now, Syria is fighting, uh, the Assad regime is fighting for its life. So if it falls, Iran might uh, even lose their uh, springboard to Israel from Syria. So there will be all, even no possibility for Iranian to send troops to Syria to fight with Israel. So there is not, not much of a chance for a conventional showdown between Israel and Iran as it could be between Israel and Syria, for example, and it was in the past between Israel and Arab states. It leaves us mostly with uh, air warfare. The Iranians uh, have approximately uh, 300 long-range surface-to-surface uh, Shi'ab free missiles. Those are basically the only missiles that could uh, be launched from Iran and to hit Israel. Uh, they can carry each one of them one ton of explosive or maybe also a chemical warhead. Uh, but it's important to mention that Iran has only about 10 launchers for those missiles. So of course you cannot like shoot all of them in one strike. You have to shoot them every time you have to reload the missile on the launcher and shoot it. And this is, a, of course, if you <coughs> assume that all the launchers are operational and they will continue to be operational. And also you have to take into consideration that Israel has the air missile that might intercept at least part of the Shia free missiles. So as long as Iran does not have nuclear weapons, especially one that they can put on the Shia free, so it's not much of a threat to Israel. The, more bi the biggest threat to Israel in that uh, perspective is, of course, the Hezbollah. It's a pro-Iranian uh, non-state organization in Lebanon we are all familiar with. Uh, it has approximately 50,000 rockets and missiles. They, of course, could, create, could cause Israel much more damage and casualties. And the big question, of course, if, if there is some kind of a uh, confrontation between Israel and Iran, what will the Hezbollah do? Of course, uh, there are sometimes you hear voices uh, inside Hezbollah, mostly from Nasrallah, that he might not just uh, salute and uh, obey any order from Iran to launch a war, a uh, full-scale war against Israel. And um, we can never know in the, when the moment comes what he will actually do. Of course, uh, he knows that uh, Iran could cut his funds, but Israel could cut the Hezbollah to pieces. So it's one consideration. Of course, the major issue is the nuclear one. Uh, right now, um, you could only assume, assume by generally speaking, uh, what is the progress of the Iranian nuclear project. And even in the future, <laughs> what will be a direct threat on Israel when the Iranians uh, will have a, a bomb or capability to produce a bomb or they will be able to put this bomb on a long-range surface-to-surface uh, missile on a plane, or will they, when they would conduct a nuclear test. So when you actually start to say there is a nuclear threat on Israel. Israel is kind of a lesson from the 1973 war against the Arabs. Uh, you can say that uh, you cannot uh, um, assume what will be the intentions of her arrival, but it has, it has to go by his uh, capabilities. And of course, it will be especially true in, in case of a nuclear Iran. For Israel, Iran is kind of an enigma because there was, as I said, there was, no, there was never a war between Israel and Iran. There is no real of, uh, reason for dispute. And it's kind of uh, ridiculous in a way that Iran, that doesn't have nuclear weapons, is threatened on uh, Israel that, according to non-Israeli sources, has nuclear weapons. Uh, and this is kind of a puzzle for Israel, why the Iranians are so eager to push themselves into this conflict uh, 1,000 miles away. And of course, you, we all know that Iran has plenty on her plate as far as internal problems and also uh, problems with her neighbors in the Persian Gulf and all around. Uh, Israel, of course, does uh, understand that Iran uh, should, should wa wa will want a nuclear weapon because Iran looks on her neighbors Iran, she, she, it is a regional power, and he knows that Israel has nuclear weapons. The United States, of course, has nuclear weapons. And, of course, Pakistan, 
almost 180 million people, most of them Sunnis, a neighbor of Iran, of course, has also nuclear weapons. So they are, from their perspective, also have the right to have nuclear weapons. Israel doesn't want to go that road, want to basically, in that uh, perspective, doesn't want to go at all to this uh, nuclear issue, because of course, then after that, Israel maybe uh, has to change their own nuclear policy. And Israel's nuclear policy is basically, as we all know, it tries all the time to avoid dealing with it. Uh, generally speaking, Israel call it like a bomb in the basement. And it's in the basement because it's something you don't want anyone to see, not even your, the guests that come to your living room. So like downstairs, the Roman, the, ones, the Israeli approach is like, let sleeping dogs lie. Doesn't want to talk about it. It doesn't, of course, conduct any kind of a, a test about it. And there is some kind of an agreement between Israel and the United States. Israel does not conduct any test, does not declare openly that it has nuclear weapons. And in return, the United States basically avoid dealing with uh, this kind of situation. If you want, you can call it kind of a don't ask, don't tell. <laughs> there are talks from time to time about if Iran uh, has nuclear weapons, that you can basically say that it will be like in the Cold War, the balance of terror between the Soviet Union and the United States. Both of them, uh, of course, uh, had uh, nuclear weapons, uh, but they, uh, none of them used that uh, because they feel that mutual destruction. And it's, uh, you can say it uh, could apply that also to the Iranian-Israeli conflict. Yes, yet you, you must uh, take into consideration other factors. For example, uh, the distance between Israel and Iran, although there is a thousand miles between them, it's not like the Soviet Union and the United States. Therefore, the alert each side will have will be much shorter. In the nuclear age, it has ma uh, lots of uh, uh, importance. Also, the United States and the Soviet Union could have started a war in a conventional, it could be a conventional stage. There was the, like the Folder Gap in Germany, where forces from each side could have confronted each other. And uh, that gave time, at least if it would have happened, of course, it would have gave time to the governments to resolve the crisis before it will escalate into a nuclear one. Since Israel and Iran they don't have any border between them, they might immediately escalate into a nuclear uh, showdown. Another major problem, the United States and the Soviet Union had diplomatic relationships. After the Cuba Missile Crisis, they had the, hot, the hotline, the red phone. There is no such thing between Israel and Iran. They don't talk with each other at all, not directly at least. So this is a problem. Maybe the two states, especially if both of them will have nukes, that they might unofficially agree that there will be some kind of a mediator, some country that has ties both to Israel and Iran, Egypt, Turkey, India, Russia, but still in, if there will be a, a, a crisis, a major crisis between Israel and Iran, it might be too late to use this kind of a system. Also another major important uh, uh, difference between is, uh, the Cold War and now, uh, if there would have been a massive attack on the United States, a nuclear attack from the Soviet Union, since the United States is quite isolated and also could have received after the attack help from our neighbors, like from Canada. While Israel is surrounded by Arab states that even if they don't like Iran, if there will be a massive attack, a nuclear attack on Israel and the Israeli government and the military will not function at all, then the Arab states around her will basically close in for the kill. Because only if, uh, if uh, only beside all the known aspects of the Arab-Israeli conflict, that uh, there are also strategic reasons for Egypt, it will be opportunity to get uh, the south of Israel, which will be a corridor to Jordan, and from there the rest of the Arab world, which was always was a dream for Egypt, and so on. Uh, there is also, of course, in the there will be a nuclear Iran. Then Israel and Iran will find themselves. Uh, examine all kinds of doomsday scenarios that um, you can mention some of them. For example, if the Iran has nukes and then will, there will be a revolution in Iran and the regime there will lose and you will understand his leadership that they are going nowhere, they have no, nowhere to run. And so they can say we might as well take Israel with us. So they will send the uh, uh, their last decision could be launching their nukes against Israel and furthermore, 
if they know that Israel will retaliate, but they, will not, but, but they might not care because they will, Israel will retaliate against the same people that overthrow them. So this is one aspect. Also, the, another major problem for Israel that um, if Iran gets the nukes, of course, Saudi Arabia and other Arab countries might also get it. So for Israel, militarily speaking, Saudi Arabia with nuclear weapons will be even a bigger threat than Iran. Because of the distance between Iran and Israel, Israel might get enough alert in case there will be a launch of a missile from Iran. But with Saudi Arabia, especially in the northwest, there is an airfield like the Tabuk airfield, which the Saudis, it gives the Saudis a springboard to attack on Israel. And also it's uh, important to mention that the Saudis have much better air force than the Iranians. They have F-15 and all that. So it gives them another possibility to basically strike Israel with a nuclear weapon in case there will be a nuclear showdown. Of course, the Saudis also don't, don't want it generally, but if they all of uh, Iran, Israel, and Saudi Arabia will have nuclear weapons, each one of them will suspect the other. Of course, from, also from Saudis, uh, the Saudi point of view, it's worth mentioning that uh, Israel and Iran are both, both of them are, their, uh, are the enemies of Saudi Arabia. So it will be worth the while for the Saudis to create some kind of provocation in which Israel and Iran will destroy each other. This is only one of the uh, implications in which a nuclear Iran will be very bad news for Iran. Also, you cannot rule it out completely that Saudi Arabia will buy a weapons from Pakistan and also maybe approach uh, Pakistan to deploy Pakistan units with nuclear weapons on Saudi Arabia. And the last thing I think, I think Iran needs right now is an enemy like Pakistan with, uh, as I said, 180 million people, most of them Sunnis. They have a border with Iran and they have nukes. Iran doesn't need that. Uh, also, that's about uh, Iran. Generally speaking about Israel, uh, the Israelis, for them, a threat on their existence, it's kind of, uh, I wouldn't say another day in the office, but they are used to. It's like uh, in the past there were also all kinds of uh, doomsday scenarios, only conventional ones, that uh, stayed like that. For example, after 19 1973 war between Israel and the Arabs, there were all kinds of scenarios in which Israel prepared itself to war against a vast Arab coalition that uh, could have included Egypt, Syria, maybe even Jordan, and Iraq. Never, never happened. Also, from 1973, for so 1973, Israel prepared itself for war in the Golan Heights against the Syrians in case the Syrians will try again to retake by force the Golan Heights. There was always some kind of tension, sometimes even higher, but the last almost 40 years, nothing. And such kind of a war could have started with a strike of long-range surface-to-surface missiles from Syria to the heart of Israel, even maybe with chemical warheads, and the Israelis lived with it. So they, they knew that every time, every minute, uh, theoretically, it could start, especially in the 80s when the Syria had the support of the Soviet Union. But they lived with it. It was okay. It wasn't like 10 years ago in the Second Intifada when there was, I wouldn't say fear all around, but the uh, Israelis, every time they went for, to the bus or to a restaurant or to the mall, and they saw, they saw the security guard that checked the bags of everyone so that in order to make sure that they are not uh, suicide bombers, this was much closer. They saw it all around. So they still go on, go, went on with their uh, uh, regular life, but it was much more uh, obvious that there is a side effect. But on the other hand, the Syrian threat, you know, war with Syria was out there, but it wasn't that uh, real. If Iran gets a nuclear weapon, it can also have other uh, negative repercussions on Israel. Right now, of course, Israel was established in order to be the safe house for the Jewish people. And with all the wars and the conflicts along the years, in a way, it, 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 it still is. But with the nuclear one, it might change. Israel might become the most dangerous place for Jews to be. And this could have very serious uh, implication on the immigration to and from Israel. Also on about the uh, foreign investments in Israel. Also about the, the way the, that the military, the Israeli military will have to invest a large part of his budget on preparation for a nuclear war. For the long haul, and it's like you can uh, have, a, of course, an entire discussion about it, for, but from the Israelis, at least for some of them, maybe the middle class or others, it could be just too much. They can live with the 
right now with the, the burden. There are also, maybe you know about the economic problems in Israel and other social issues and all that. So they can live with that also with all those threats with the Arabs and the problem with the Palestinians, but the nuclear Iran might be too much for them. And all of that in the bottom line might cost for the long haul a slow but a steady decline of Israel without the Iranians even uh, saying that they have a nuclear weapons. Uh, other factors I just want to say in a few words. There's, uh, the, of course, there are more than 20,000 uh, Jews in Iran. Israel has to take that into consideration in case of an attack on Iran, especially in a nuclear showdown. Some of them might be, get hurt from the Israeli bombs, and after, after that, there might be reprisal against them by the Iranians. Another factor, of course, there is also the Holocaust factor that it's very known, and uh, many of the Israelis are aware of that. Uh, I wouldn't say especially, but like uh, what you call the Ashkenaz Jews, that their families came from Europe, like the one for, uh, that uh, the families of Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister, the Minister of Defense, Ehud Barak, and many people of the elite in Israel, the po uh, in politics, military, and so on, and of course many of the ordinary Israelis, like my entire family. Um, Overall, the, you can sum it up, uh, what the Israelis could do. Israelis could basically start some kind of preventive war against Iran, like they did in 1956 against Egypt. And one of the reasons there was the military buildup of the Egyptian military. Then it was conventional military buildup. Now it could be because of the Iranian nuclear project. Israel could wait until the last moment if there will be some kind of a crisis between Israel and Iran and then launched some kind of preventive, uh, some, uh, preemptive strike, like in 1967. But of course, it will be much more dangerous in the nuclear age. Israel could also do nothing. In 1973 war, Israel uh, figured out, out before the war that uh, if they will launch an airstrike against the Arab militaries, it might help her uh, in the beginning of the war. But mostly because they, uh, did not feel, but they did not want to, I would say annoyed, but they did not want the, that the, to disrupt the relationship between Israel and the United States, so they did not do it. Maybe you can do some kind of a comparison to now also, because there is, you know, as we know, some kind of uh, pressure, you can argue about that, from the United States on Israel not to do anything. So basically Israel right now will do, probably will wait. Um, and we'll see if the sanction could work, if the overall pressure on Iran will work. If not, they will consider the military option. And if they assume the military option will do more harm than good, they might just leave it and continue to prepare to the possibility of a nuclear Iran with all the repercussions I mentioned. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Trito. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, delight to be here. Thank you, Ehud. I think that was a very sober analysis. I, I want to commend you also because I, I found it to be um, very much based on a logic that I think is widely acceptable. Uh, and it's actually quite different from uh, some of the perhaps more politically motivated um, comments that um, uh, one hears at time. Uh, and I think this is this is very helpful because it's it's well beyond time that we have a rational conversation about something of this importance. And, and I want to commend you for that. I think uh, there's a couple of things you said in the beginning, so I'm going to change my uh, presentation a little bit to address those, because I think they're a fantastic starting point for a good conversation. You mentioned correctly that there is no border dispute between Iran and Israel. One could also add that there is no historical dispute between the Jewish people and the Iranian people. On the contrary, uh, in the last 2,500 years, there's been more very positive elements between the two peoples than there have been negative elements. One of the false perceptions that exist, I would say, in the West, partly because of sloppy uh, coverage of this issue, is a perception that this is yet another one of those ancient thousand-year-old conflicts in the region. That is not the case. This conflict is no longer than about 20 or so years old. But then the question is, there is nevertheless a conflict. And then one can go in two different directions. There could either be a conflict because this is some sort of an ideological battle. I find very little <coughs> evidence for that. 
or there can be a conflict because there is um, a conflict that has more of a hegemonic nature in which there is a strategic rivalry for dominance and power positioning in the region. There wasn't any border dispute, to the best of my knowledge, between the United States and Vietnam, but there certainly was a war. So just the absence of border disputes doesn't mean that there may not be uh, a, a real strong foundation for a conflict. In my assessment, the conflict between Iran and Israel is of that strategic nature, and it has a lot to do with the changes that occurred in the region in the early 1990s, in which with the defeat of Saddam Hussein's Iraq and with the collapse of the Soviet Union, the configuration of the geopolitical map in the region was fundamentally redrawn. And it was precisely those two factors, the Soviet Union and Iraq, that constituted, that constituted the basis for the very same collaboration that Ehud correctly pointed to, that existed prior to this, in which both Iran and Israel, even Iran under the Islamic Republic, had <coughs> common strategic perspectives on the situation in the region. And though, of course, the collaboration during the time of the Shah is incomparable to what happened in the 1980s, the geopolitical situation did prompt even the Islamic Republic and even Israel at that time to do things behind the scenes that eventually came to the surface, such as the Iran-Contra scandal. The fact that so much of the Iranian uh, arms purchases during the 1980s actually came from Israel because of a, a similar perspective on what the main threats in the region were. All of that changes, however, in the mid-1990s or early 1990s because the two common threats evaporate. And now you have a new situation in the region in which there is an effort to create a new order in the region, a new pecking order. And in that, you could see in the press in Israel in late 1991 that for the first time there's talk about Iran as a potential threat, something that was rarely found in the Israeli media back in the 1980s, and particularly from Israeli um, officials. Back in the 1980s, what seemed to have still guided, at least implicitly, the Israeli approach towards Iran was the periphery doctrine, the idea that Israel's security is best achieved by creating alliances with the non-Arab states in the periphery of the Middle East in order to balance the Arab states in Israel's vicinity. By 1991, you start to hear the opposite argument, that the Arab vicinity no longer is a threat because they had lost their conventional military capability to pose a threat. But the Persian periphery suddenly emerges as one of the more powerful states in the region. And for a whole <coughs> different set of factors of historical interest that perhaps I shouldn't go into here, nevertheless, you see a geopolitical rivalry that was ignited, and it's still being played out today. And it is the root cause of this conflict today, even though there aren't <coughs> any uh, conflicts. Uh, Ehud also mentioned that from the Israeli perspective, there was a, a mystery. Why are the Iranians pushing themselves into the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Um, there's two points to make on that. First of all, the Iranian government under the Islamic Republic did not have lesser ambitions in the region than the Shah's government. While the Shah's government wanted to play a leadership role in the region and defined Iran as being the Japan <coughs> of West Asia and defined the area of influence to be guided by other factors um, uh, such as alliances with the US, etc., the Islamic Republic was seeking to have leadership in an Islamic world in which obviously the immediate Middle Eastern uh, neighborhood was critical. To lead the Islamic world, and not have a direct role in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is next to an impossibility. Particularly when you are already dealing with severe Arab-Persian rifts, severe Shia-Sunni rifts, you needed something else to be able to bridge those gaps. And political Islam and a particular focus on the Israeli conflict was something that was calculated by the Iranian government in the early 1980s to be able to overcome those tensions and provide Iran with um, an ability to play a leadership role in the region as a whole. The second point is that the Iranians are asking a similar question. 
Why have the Israelis from the very early 1990s, even before Iran was very deeply involved in this, acted so aggressively to A, not permit the Iranians to be able to expand trade into the Central Asian states, put so much pressure on the United States not to pursue diplomacy with Iran and start pursuing sanctions on Iran. This was actually the same Israel that only a couple of years earlier during the Iran-Contra scandal was urging the United States to talk to Iran, to sell arms to Iran, and not to pay attention to the Iranian rhetoric, the very anti-Israeli, very uh, venomous anti-Israeli rhetoric that Iran was uh, adopting because that rhetoric wasn't reflective of actual policy. What we have today, though, is that all of this has come to a very dangerous climax. I think it uh, spelled out a whole set of various scenarios and why uh, a nuclear weapon in Iran would be quite a negative thing, not just for Israel, but for a large part of the region as a whole. I would argue that would also be a tremendously negative thing for Iran. But the issue right now is actually not whether Iran gets nuclear weapons or not. The real issue is whether Iran will have a nuclear capability, whether it will have an enrichment program. That's a very different red line. And that is the red line that currently is being fought over in a rather public fight between the Israeli government and the Obama administration, in which the Obama administration's red line, not articulated by Obama administration political officials, but articulated by the Obama administration's military officials, have been that the red line is that Iran should not be able to acquire a nuclear weapon. That is the red line. The Israeli red line is similar to the red line of the Bush administration, which was that Iran should not be able to have enrichment, zero enrichment, because that would give them the capability to build a nuclear weapon at some point. Those are two fundamentally different red lines. In fact, if the red line is capability, arguably, Iran has already gone way beyond that and we should technically be at war. Right now, uh, that conflict is also being played out in the U.S. Senate, where some senators are trying to force on the Obama administration the uh, Bush administration's red line. The reason why the U.S. military, however, has become quite vocal in debunking the idea that Israel actually does have a viable military option. And you, I'm sure you all have noticed that there's been a whole set of articles in U.S. media quoting both current and past military officials. Saying this. First of all, it's quite an astounding phenomenon in and of itself because it is, it's a, quite a strong body blow against a major ally because what the U.S. essentially is doing is questioning Israel's military credibility. And for understandable reasons, the Israelis are tremendously upset. The military perspective, however, is that they are just responding to an attempt in which, in their perspective, seems to be to corner the United States into forcing it to have no other options but a military uh, intervention that the U.S. military has no appetite for, at least not right now. When you talk to people at the White House, it's quite a different story from what you heard a couple of years ago. Right now, because of the IEA's inspections in Iran, the White House's assessment is that if the Iranians were to do something to try to weaponize, reconfigure the centrifuges at Natanz, for instance, it would be detected within 60, 30 to 60 days by the IEA. The Iranians would need much more time than that to be able to build a nuclear weapon. So as a result, there isn't a significant fear of a sudden dash we have the situation essentially under control, is the perspective of the White House. However, if there is a military strike, and even if the American sentiment or estimation is incorrect, and the Israelis actually manage to push back the program two to three years, what it would do is, is that it would enable the Iranians to invoke chapter 10 of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, threaten to get out of the NPT, which means that we would lose the eyes and ears of the IAEA there, the very one thing that enables us to feel comfortable that there isn't a breakout capability that couldn't be detected. And just the threat of breaking out of the NPT and kicking out the inspectors would be most likely sufficient to get a significant amount of concessions from the international community, including Europe. 
and fundamentally change the current coalition that currently is putting a lot of pressure on Iran. And we would, most importantly, lose the ability to have a good estimation of where the Iranians are, are they doing anything to break out, and is there a necessity to intervene in that? That is the big fear on the, Israel, on the American side about a potential U.S. military strike. Even the Israelis agree it's not going to resolve the problem. It's only going to be able to push it back two to three years at best. That's not sufficient for the United States, particularly right now in the Middle East, that in, as a result of the Syrian uh, and many of the other uprisings in the region, because of the Arab uprisings, you have far more moving parts in the region than we did just a year ago. The more moving parts you have in the region, the more difficult it will be to predict the outcome and the second, third, and fourth degree consequences of any military intervention. The U.S. military is already overextended. It is tired of these other conflicts. And perhaps most importantly, there's nothing the military dislikes more than an undefinable objective. Because those are the type of military endeavors that almost inevitably lead to a failure. Because the goal was never really clear from the very outset. It's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. I would actually tend to agree strongly with Ehud in the assessment that the likelihood of Israel doing something is probably not that high. It's higher than it was before, mainly for political reasons, but probably not that high. And if there were to be a situation, which I incidentally believe is not imminent and certainly preventable, in which the Iranians were to build a nuclear weapon, then Israel also has ways of finding how it can live with that, however unattractive that may be. Part of the problem, I, in my view, of the Israeli military doctrine is that it is based on the assumption that threats can be eliminated. Whereas almost every other country is basing it on its ability to manage threats. Because if you're trying to eliminate every threat, you put a tremendous amount of security burden on yourself. I am more optimistic, perhaps, than Ehud, that in case there were to be that scenario, which I think, again, would be a very negative and also a preventable scenario, in which the Iranians were to get a nuclear weapon. There would be a mutual interest to establish those type of red channels, direct lines, in order to make sure that the conflict wouldn't get out of hand. In fact, those channels do exist currently when it comes to how to deal with Lebanon. And they have been in effect uh, when it comes to Hezbollah and Israel. So if that could exist right now, of course this is not something that either side is bragging about, but if that could exist right now, I have more confidence that it would be established in case the Iranians were to go and actually get a nuclear weapon. But I'll end on this. I think it's quite important to, under these circumstances, to take a step back and remind ourselves that Iran is not that close to getting a nuclear weapon. The frame is not one in which we either have to accept a nuclear bomb in Iran or bomb Iran. There are plenty of more options on the table. There's plenty of more space for decisions and time for decisions. But forcing on ourselves uh, the frame that we either have to bomb or accept a bomb is, is quite a dangerous frame to operate under because it limits our options and forces us, quite frankly, to only consider bad options. And I'll stop there. Thank you. All right, now it's your turn. Uh, questions? Yes, back there. We have a microphone, and Wendy will bring it around to you. Yeah, take your jacket off. Uh, Phil Giraldi. Um, I personally don't believe there's any evidence at all that Iran is building a nuclear weapon. I think the CIA supports that view and also Israeli intelligence. Uh, I, I do accept that uh, the possession of a nuclear weapon in that region by anyone is a danger to the entire region. Uh, I become increasingly convinced that the Israeli government does not want a war, the Iranian government does not want a war, the White House does not want a war, but that Congress and the media in the United States do want a war. <laughs> and and, I, and I, I feel somewhat strongly that they are the inciters of this war fervor that we're witnessing right now. And I'd be interested, very interested in hearing the views of our two panelists. Thank you. Ehud? I don't think also I agree with you. Israel doesn't want war, doesn't even want any kind of conflict with Iran. Maybe it's like in a kind of ironic way, 
Israel's, uh, one of Israel's hope is that uh, there will be a new Syria, and as a result of that, maybe there could be some kind of understanding between the new Syria and Israel, even without uh, any kind of uh, peace negotiation about Lebanon and about the Hezbollah, because the new Syria, based on the Sunni majority in Syria, and will not also want uh, the Hezbollah, the pro-Iranian Shia at Hezbollah to control Lebanon as it right now, they might, uh, I won't say join forces, but they will reduce his influence. As a result of that, the Hezbollah might be much weaker. Syria will be lost to Iran. And the Hamas is already checking other options, like um, relying more on uh, Sunni states like Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and even Turkey, and not about on Iran. So if Iran will lose their grip near the Mediterranean, maybe it will reduce the tension between Israel and Iran. It will have also an effect about the nuclear issue if it comes uh, involved. I agree with you that I don't believe the, U uh, the Obama administration wants a war. I don't believe the U.S. military wants a war at all. I think they've made that very clear. I don't believe that the key decision makers in Iran want a war. There may be others in Iran who want it, but it doesn't seem to be the ones that are <coughs> making the decisions. Um, I'm not as convinced that some of the key decision makers in Israel don't want a U.S. strike on Iran. I definitely agree that they would like to prefer to avoid a direct confrontation with Iran, but uh, particularly when you read the WikiLeaks, it, it, it seemed to be quite clear what they were recommending the U.S. to do. Um, I do agree with you on the central point that you were making, that we are starting to see in the media again, and if there's any elements of the media in the room right now, please don't feel directly offended or personally attacked, but I think we're starting to see a little bit of what existed during the 2002-2003 period in which the media was not asking the right questions at the right time. And as a result, false frames, misinformation went unchecked, uncorrected, and created a situation in which uh, a vast majority of the US uh, public actually was in favor of the invasion of Iraq based on the information that they had gotten. At one point, apparently, even 79% of the American public were convinced that Saddam Hussein was behind 9-11. I don't think you can credit that entirely to Dick Cheney. I think the media played a significant role in that, and I'm afraid that we may start seeing the similar patterns. Up here. Oh, back there. Yeah. All right, one more back there, then we'll come up front. And give your name, too. Um, Mark Perry. Uh, I'm so relieved that we're not going to have a war. Um, <laughs> There's a, there's a hypothesis I'd like to try out on both of you and get your reactions, and it's very cynical, but it is circulating in Washington. And Ehud, maybe you could respond first that uh, while uh, Israel is thumping the table for an escalation of pressure against Iran, I don't think it's just the media, uh, that the real target is not Iran, but it's the President of the United States that the continuing crisis over what Iran is going to do, how it's going to do it, when it's going to get a bomb, what it's going to do, when it gets a bomb, why aren't we being tough enough? All of that is driving a war fever that drives up gasoline prices and petroleum products prices in the United States, which undermines the U.S. economy, which weakens Obama, which frankly Mr. Netanyahu would love to get rid of. Is that possible? That Israel is attempting to control the American narrative and that it's a lot less worried about an Iranian bomb than we think? I, will not, I don't want to refer into the political uh, issues because it's not my expertise. I will say that for Israel to try to prevent Iran from having whatever you call it, nuclear weapons or nuclear capability to produce a weapon, it's a high priority. And it will do whatever it could. You know, in the, right now it's more on the political level, but if it fails, Israel will consider a military option. And the Israeli Air Force is preparing for that. And if there will be a kind of a dead end and the sanctions will lead to nowhere, I mean, no negotiation, no kind of, uh, the running will not slow down uh, the progress towards a nuclear weapon, the Israel might attack. So it's not uh, just a matter of uh, uh, all kinds of political maneuvers. Israel will consider a military strike. And if Israel believe, even if like it will be able to de postpone the Iranian nuclear project in two and three years, it might do it, because in two or three years it could attack again. It's not uh, something minor for Israel. It's not like the Hezbollah that Israel could live with. The nuclear one is a real threat to the survival of Israel. It's a major thing. It's not like something they take lightly that it, they, we can live with. It's like, like Hamas, the Gaza Strip, the Syrians. It's probably maybe the most dangerous 
uh, challenge Israel faced in their entire existence. So they will, might just go for it, even if the chances of reduce, of uh, delay the Iranian project two years might be even for that. It depends also on all kinds of military factors, but they might just go for it. Trina? Um, Mark, I, I hope you were the only one who interpreted what we were saying as that there's not going to be a war. That was not necessarily, uh, at least what I intended to say, and I, I think Ehud uh, would agree. Yeah. It's about how are we getting into that situation? Mm -hmm. yeah, sure. Is it because there are people in the governments right now are driving it to that direction? Or is it because of other factors? One of the things we have to keep in mind that even though there is not a White House right now that in my estimation wants a war, the status quo is not motionless. The status quo is a gravitation towards a military conflict. The only way to avoid that is to actually pursue the right type of diplomacy that can reverse the course of this, change the trajectory of this. I think the Obama administration was genuine in his attempt to start diplomacy, but for various reasons, including the absence of political space and the unwillingness to fight to get more political space, it ended up being a single roll of the dice. And it ended up being just a couple of one-off meetings in which the two sides exchanged ultimatums. That's not the type of diplomacy that has worked in the past. I'm encouraged to hear that Secretary Clinton is talking about a diplomatic process. I'm hearing that from the White House as well. I hope that means an effort not to come to the table and get everyone to come to the table, but an effort to stay at the table. Meaning that we will have setbacks at the negotiating table, but we can't give up at the first setback, which is exactly what we did in October 2009. If that process is put in place, I think there is a chance of being able to prevent this. But if we continue to go like this and there's no real effort to change the trajectory, then we're going to get closer and closer to the edge. And while one can say that this looks, sounds perhaps a bit naive, and, and, and certainly is, uh, if one takes a look at it from the perspective that the stakes are probably higher now than any time before, but the flexibility of the various sides seems to be at its lowest for various reasons, including past experiences in the just last two years, but also because of the fact that there is a presidential election in the United States. It doesn't add to a pretty picture. We'll come up here and then here. Up here. Okay. We'll take you two. My name is Fawzel Asmar. Uh, yes, but maybe there are no borders between Israel and, and Iran, but definitely there is a conflict. Uh, if you look at, at the whole, uh, whole picture of the Middle East, and, you, and uh, we have to think why there is a conflict in the Middle East and where Iran will stand. Iran, I agree with you, is looking to be uh, or to hold a leadership of, on, on, on the Muslim uh, world. This is a conflict. The Gulf states afraid of Iran, but they are not ready to uh, uh, to to go ahead and admit that pub publicly. But one thing that you avoid, you and the hood, is the occupation. I mean, the Israelis are not ready. The, the, the whole thing is, uh, uh, the whole conflict is the Israeli occupation. And, uh, the, and, refuel, and, and the refuse of Israel to accept any uh, proposal, especially the Arab proposal that they are ready to, uh, to recognize Israel with not just the Arab state, but the Muslim state, to solve the Palestinian problem. Now, this problem, if it will not be solved, I, the, the conflict is going to be not just with Iran, it's going to look what happened in Turkey, with Turkey, and with, the, with other with Arab countries. So there is a conflict that we have to address, and there is a conflict that it has to be solved. Otherwise, uh, uh, the, the, the whole thing will continue. Yes, Iran is worried about, uh, about what, the, what Israel is doing, is worried about itself, you know, to, to protect herself, not just from Israel, from, uh, from other countries. So we, we have to take this in consideration. Trina, you want to go first? That's sure. Um, I agree with you in the sense that the continuation of the 
um, Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the continuation of the occupation, is creating um, a lot of openings for many different elements to take advantage of that conflict. And it's starting to have repercussions well beyond just the Israelis and the Palestinians. <laughs> and I also agree with you that obviously it would be quite desirable and quite valuable to end that conflict as quickly as possible in a just way. But I would caution you to be careful in thinking that if that <coughs> conflict is resolved, that some way somehow would resolve the Israeli-Iranian conflict. I don't think it will. It will make it perhaps more difficult to uh, exploit the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as part of that larger rivalry. But the ri rivalry was not started because of the occupation, nor will it end because of the occupation. <coughs> it is a rivalry that is taking advantage of the occupation. Almost every conflict in the region has now an added component of how the US and Israel on one hand are taking, it, are taking a side within that specific conflict against Iran, or furthermore with the Saudis and others. You have an uprising beginning in, uh, in Syria, and now it's turned into a geopolitical battle. It didn't start like that, it started like an uprising. Many of the other conflicts in the region, including the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, are, are of that same um, nature. Again, I want to emphasize, it would be fantastic to resolve it. It would be great if the US made a much stronger commitment to resolve it. It would be fantastic if um, all sides could find that compromise. But I don't believe that in and of itself would resolve the rivalry that exists between Iran and Israel. It would force it to manifest itself differently. It would weaken the... It could weaken it, the, absolutely. The, 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 the Iranian position in the Middle East. It would weaken the Iranian yeah. position in the sense that the Iranians would not be able to take <coughs> advantage of that issue. But that doesn't resolve the conflict. Hey, who? Yes, I agree with Rita that basically you should disconnect between the Arab-Israeli, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the Iranian-Israeli conflict. There is such a... There is a, a certain, uh, you can say there is a certain influence uh, on, the, on both conflicts uh, by each other, but basically Israel has to deal with the Palestinian issue, and the problem is that Iran, instead of being part of the solution, Iran, if you're speaking about some kind of an ideal uh, situation, Iran is of course Muslim, but it's also non-Arab, so it could have been a mediator between Israel and the Palestinians in the one case like uh, Turkey also, a Muslim non-Arab state was a mediator between Israel and Syria in 2008. It is a possibility, but instead of Iran being part of the solution, it's actually part of the problems. I don't think the Iranians care too much, too much. the Iranian mostly <coughs> yeah, it's mostly Persian, care too much about the uh, Palestinians that are Sunnis and Arabs. During the 2006 war when the Hezbollah bombed the north of Israel, also uh, Palestinians, uh, Arab Israelis were killed also. If there would be a nuclear showdown between Israel and Iran, the fallout literally will hurt also the Palestinians in Israel in the West Bank and also the Israelis that the Palestinians inside in Israel. So it's like there is a connection, but it's also a separate. Way. Maybe to make a quick comment on yeah. this. Um, I, I don't disagree with Ehud that uh, arguing that I Iran is part of the problem, but I, I'm really curious to know who is part of the solution. On this issue, I, I I couldn't name a single one <laughs> on the on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Yeah, I mean, the one could be part of the solution in case it, it will it choose to change dramatically a strategy. Of course, I don't see it with the current Iranian leadership, but will be a mediator. Of course, it's an ideal situation, as I said. But there is a possibility that Iran could be kind of a mediator in an ideal world between Israel and the Palestinians, and by that try to resolve the problems instead of uh, 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 supporting, in the past at least, because now it's a little bit uh, shaky relationship between the, the Iran and the Hamas, but it supported the Hamas who opposed any kind of solution with Israel. Instead of, Iran could have supported the Palestinian Authority that supports a, a, a peaceful solution with Israel, and it didn't. Yes, yes. Uh, Roy yes. Gutman from uh, McClatchy Newspapers. I guess I'm the media guy here. So to respond to the uh, question earlier, um, or the point earlier, about the media. Uh, I'll talk about the media minus McClatchy. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah, actually, McClatchy is the successor to Knight Ritter, and we were the only guys who questioned the uh, weapons of mass destruction claims in uh, Iraq. But uh, right now, there, there are a lot of reports out there that are, are playing up uh, the differences between Israel uh, and Iran. Uh, I mean, there was the AP story just the other day that 
if uh, Israel, that Israel, if it decides to go uh, uh, military against uh, Iran, it might not even consult the United States. I don't know who the source of that story was, uh, uh, but I have to assume the AP had a, had a genuine source and that it was not something invented out of thin air. <coughs> so whoever did that actually was manipulating uh, the media to try to deliver a message. And, uh, you know, it, what we should be doing in a situation like that is trying to explain who's manipulating us, by the way, because that's kind of incendiary uh, uh, coverage. But I want to get back to uh, Ehud's point. In fact, both of you might made a, a very strong point of all the reasons why Israel would not uh, want to go to war at this time. Um, and I th think that they were eminently common sense and, and based on facts. But if that's the case, why was it necessary for the National Security Advisor, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and everybody else on, on Earth to go to Israel, to sit down with Bibi, and to make that point, and then to leak to at least one major newspaper that the, uh, the NIE, the National Intelligence Estimate, now underway, says that it'll be years before. In other words, there must be, I'm sorry, there, where there's smoke, there's some, some fire going on. Uh, what, what was going on in Israel? As a uh, previous questioner mentioned, uh, you know, there's a, there's a wide assumption, certainly among diplomats, that uh, Bibi would like nothing better than to have a new president uh, rather than Obama. Um, is this all a kind of, are, are, they, are, are Israelis uh, trying to affect the American elections? Uh, were they trying to, s to beat the drums in order to uh, corner the Iranians who are already so cornered that I'm not sure if they're capable of even making a decision? Anyway, that's one question. The second question for Trita, going back to your book, which I thought was really first class, very good diplomatic reporting, um, there was a specific deal on the table that this book really centers on. And uh, it was an agreed deal that seemed to fit the parameters for uh, what the U.S. had set out, uh, and, uh, and it was done <laughs> right in the nick of time, just before the sanctions were imposed. Um, is, there s is some kind of a deal like that uh, still uh, feasible. I mean, from the Iranian side, are they willing to update that deal, increase the amount of uh, of, of uh, uranium that would be uh, sent abroad for enrichment, um, or is is that a dead letter now? True. Sure. I, I would like to address what the other thing that you said as well. There is some fire behind the smoke. The question of what kind of fire is it? And I think the reason why the military has been so active in, in the going on of these trips, etc., <coughs> is partly to prevent Israel from doing so, but also to uh, prevent what they perceive to be Israeli pressures to redefine the American red line. And that's going to play out next week when you have the visit and, and you have uh, APAC's major conference. That is the real issue, because if the red line is changed to something that the U.S. military currently doesn't agree with, there's going to be significant question marks how that is Im implemented. So that is a very central part of the conflict. Um, there is, of course, also the, the perception that this is used as a bluff to pressure the U.S. to do things that it otherwise doesn't want to do. Now, on the issue of the Brazilian-Turkish deal, this goes back. It's very important to keep in mind. This was an American proposal. This was um, created in the White House during the spring of 2009 when they were trying to figure out what can be done to reduce Iran's LEU stockpile so they would not have enough of LEU in order to build a bomb. Because that was viewed as a very dangerous scenario that would add pressure for the U.S. to take drastic measures. With the Iranians then coming and asking to buy fuel pads for their Tehran research reactor, half the problem got resolved. Because now there wasn't a need to come up with a mechanism to convince the Iranians to give up the LEU. One could just suggest to them, sure, we'll send you the fuel pads, but we'll build it through your own LEU. So this was an American proposal from the very outset. The benchmarks were American as well. It was 1,200 kilos that needed to be shipped out approximately a year to produce the fuel pads, uh, making sure that the um, uh, the swap would not take place on Iranian soil, etc. What the Brazilians did in May 2010, by going there and mediating, and it's important to keep in mind, the Turks and the Brazilians, the Brazilians in particular, uh, the Turks in particular, were involved already in November 2009. General Jones were having meeting with them and <coughs> encouraging them to come up with solutions that would convince the Iranians <coughs> to agree to the proposal that was on the table. That included, incidentally, already back then, a conversation about putting the LEU in an escrow in Turkey. Then the Brazilians get more involved in the beginning of 2010. 
and that actually that's when they start to team up. They were already involved a little bit in, in the in this, uh, fall of the previous year. By the time they go there to, to <coughs> negotiate, and this is an interesting point because there's been some argument, bizarre arguments in my view. Oh, the Iranians only agreed to this because it was on the eve of sanctions. Well, actually, that's when sanctions are mostly successful, right before you implement them. What is it that you want? Do you want to impose sanctions or you want to use the threat of sanctions to get a deal? If you get the deal, you can't complain about it and say, oh, they only did this to get rid of the sanctions. Well, that's our logic. Uh, but it's actually a coincidence because the trip of Lula to Iran had been scheduled already back in February. And in February, most people thought that the sanctions would be passed sometime in late March or early April. It didn't end up being that way because of the resistance from Russia and China. But once they go there, what they're using is the letter that President Obama had sent both Lula and Erdogan, which was based on a conversation that they had had on April 13th in Washington, D.C. during the Zero Summit that Obama had invited these leaders for. The letter became the final word on what the U.S. wants because there had been plenty of meetings with Secretary Clinton, with um, uh, General Jones and others, in which there had been mixed signals. They had orally mentioned to the Turks and the Brazilians that 1,200 kilos would no longer be enough. It needed to be updated. Orally, that had been mentioned. Orally, it had also been mentioned that 20% was now a major problem. It needs to be addressed. None of that, however, made it into the letter signed by the president. And the Turks and the Brazilians, because of the mixed signals, treated the letter of the president with his signature as the final word of the US government on this issue which I don't think we can blame them for. It's a letter, and anyone who's worked in the US government that knows that getting a letter signed by the president is not an easy project. It goes through a lot of different uh, uh, filters. But what the Brazilians didn't know, of course, was that the US had already received an approval from, Tur from Russia and China on the Friday before the Saturday or Sunday when Lula arrived in Tehran the sanctions had already been okayed by Russia and China. So when they're negotiating and they manage to get the, U the Iranians to agree to the benchmarks in the letter that were built on the benchmarks from the previous deal, um, they did not know that essentially the US and Russia and China had already come to an agreement on the sanctions. They find out about that when Amorim, the Brazilian foreign minister, calls Secretary Clinton to brief her on the deal. Uh, so it shows a very sad situation in which because of the domestic political scene in the U.S., because of the upcoming midterm elections in Congress, the U.S. government actually essentially run out of political space to be able to say yes to the nuclear breakthrough and instead said yes to sanctions. And they did so partly because if they had gone with the nuclear deal, Congress would have gone forward with their own sanctions anyways. And those sanctions would have targeted Russia and China. And that would have created a conflict in the Security Council. And that would have been taken advantage of by the Iranians. And the entire international consensus against Iran that Obama had carefully manufactured would have fallen apart. The question is, why wasn't there enough of a political will or capital to tell Congress, we just got a deal. There's no need for you to pass the sanctions. But the White House's estimation was that they would not win that battle, so they didn't even try to fight it. Hey, Basically, I'm thinking that the United States and Israel are fully aware to all the aspects they, that they, they are, the Israel and the United States have to deal with. Of course, there is a different perspective. For the United States, they might live with a nuclear one because it will be for them kind of a North Korea in the Middle East. For Israel, it might be something too dangerous for her because it will be a clear present danger for the survival of Israel. Israel will give this overall uh, political pro process a chance in the economic, political, and in a way military pressure that is going on right now on Iran. If in a matter of weeks, months, Israel will see that they are going nowhere and the Iranians are continuing their, uh, with their nuclear project, and there will also other military factors that you have to take into consideration. I, I believe I have no personal knowledge right now, but the Israelis are probably working on improving their bombs and their techniques and tactics, because the main problem, military speaking, is not to reach Iran, by whatever you are, however you go, although it's a long distance, and also to overcome the Iranian air defense and the Iranian air force, which are 
quite obsolete, but to basically penetrate the layers of concrete and rocks sometimes that above the facilities. If Israel assumes that there are some kind of a solution, maybe not perfect, but in Israel, like with Iron Dome, proved that in the past, that when there is an emergency, they can develop pretty fast a military solution. Maybe it will not work, but since it's a, such a critical a subject, if they will see that the political process is going nowhere, they might just go ahead. Don? Do you agree, do you agree this to, that the Israelis are putting pressure on the U.S. To be right the, the red line. There is pressure on both sides. It's like a, it's all, uh, they two types of middle. Of course, they are allies, but they are two different states with different interests. So each one of them try to maneuver the other to the best position. Don. Uh, Don Wallace, this is a question for Peter Parsi. You know, you've spoken about diplomacy to the United States and Iran. I want to talk to us about that, U.S. and Iran. And you seem to fault the United States, but let's put that to one side. I really appreciate your insights into Iran, uh, in other words, what do you think, how would diplomacy proceed from the Iranian point of view? With it, looking from, from Iran out, do you honestly believe that they are capable of conducting diplomacy <coughs> in such a way as to reach one of those better results which you, which you hope for? Thank you. First of all, let me say, um, if you read a book, you'll see that my objective is not to find who I can blame the most. That's a rather futile exercise. I'll leave that to others. Uh, but I think there is plenty of mistakes committed on all sides. I was asked about the Turkish-Brazilian deal. And in that situation, I think the Obama administration did commit a mistake. And I think down the road, we're going to realize the magnitude of that mistake much better. It might not be as visible right now. In 2009, in my es estimation, the Iranians committed a mistake. Certainly, they had their reasons, and some of them are not completely illegitimate, just as much as the U.S.'s reasons to not go for the deal because of the fear of what Congress would do is not illegitimate. But nevertheless, I think it was a mistake, but at the e because at the end of the day, you have to make the tough decisions. Are the Iranians capable of negotiating that way? It's difficult to tell. In 2009, clearly they were not. The real reason why the deal broke down was not because of their objections about um, the lack of guarantees, although I think they were genuine about them, uh, I think it is understandable that they were wondering why they should let their strategic assets be in the hands of the West for a full year before they get their fuel pads back, mindful of how much they mistrust the West. I don't think that is uh, um, something they just made up, but I don't think it was what at the end of the day killed the deal. It was the difficulty for the Iranian elite to come to an agreement on anything because of the continuation of the infighting. And the administration was aware of this. And it was a risk that they committed, that they took when they decided to pursue diplomacy at that time. The president at one point said that they would pursue diplomacy once the dust had settled. But it wasn't clear if the dust had settled or not, referring to all the infighting in Iran. Um, what I think the administration has tried to do, and I'm not so sure it's the most wise thing for them to do, is that they really try to ratchet things up to the extent that they will really drive this issue to a climax in the hope that under those circumstances, Khamenei will be forced to make decisions that they otherwise believe he would try to evade. That's part of the effort of trying to recreate the, the impression that there is a credible military threat, all of these sanctions, etc., etc. It's a very risky thing to do because we have no control over how the Iranians read or misread a situation. But I think it's important to keep one thing in mind. In the various cases that the U.S. has succeeded in negotiating and gotten a deal, of, in a conflict that is as deep and as emotional as this one is, it's usually taken about four years, not two meetings in October. Four years for the U.S. and Vietnam to normalize relations between 1990 and 1994, over the course of two presidents. Another six years to get a full trade agreement. Exactly seven years to get <coughs> Gaddafi to agree to give up his nuclear weapons. 700 or so days for uh, Senator Mitchell to get the Good Friday Agreement. And in none of those cases did the deal get accepted because it was flawless, because it was perfect because the other side didn't cheat, because they didn't play for time. Of course they did, and so did we. 
It succeeded because we had the political will to overcome the imperfections of the deal because of recognition and realization that however imperfect the deal was, it was better than the alternative, which in the case of Iran increasingly looks like a military confrontation. That level of political will is necessary both on the Iranian and the U.S. side. And I would put a question mark as to whether either the U.S. or Iran, current leaderships, have that level of political will. I think they have the desire, but I'm not convinced if they have the political <coughs> will on either side. Just, just, just the same question. 20, 2012, not 2009. Today, and just looking at Iran, not looking at the U.S., looking at it from the point of view of Iran, do you think, and you've maybe have answered it, that they have the you know, desire for, I don't know, do they have the internal arrangements to conduct successful diplomacy, even if it takes four years? I think it's a proposition worth testing. At the end of the day, it's something that we don't seem to register. Why did Turkey and Brazil succeed? If it is so impossible for them to negotiate, why did the Turks and the Brazilian manage to do it? I think we would be wise to study how they did it and see what we can learn. But even if we do, we may still fail because what the situation was back then may be different what it is right now. But if we are trying to wait for the perfect time I'm pretty convinced that perfect time will never emerge. But it's, it's a fair question. It is difficult. And incidentally, the Iranians are asking themselves the exact same question. Who's making the decisions in the United States? Is it Congress or is it the President? Does the President have the strength to be able to override Congress if they're creating problems? They're asking the same questions. We're going to take two more questions. It would be nice to have one from a lady. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'm uh, Diane Perlman, School for Conflict Analysis and Resolution at George Mason. Um, so the one word that appealed to me the most was preventable today. So the forces of escalation are obviously having momentum and they're unconscious and going ahead. You know, any forces of de-escalation would require a lot of consciousness, creativity, and intention to counter that. So, um, and also the... Um, the idea of second order change. You know, everything's about pressure coercion and it, it's, um, there's no good end game to that, I think. And the idea would be to reduce tension, to reduce enmity. So I just have some different thoughts. One, and I'm also starting to explore with my colleagues and the next four days I'll be with uh, mediators beyond borders in Baltimore. Then after that I'll be at APAC as press. Um, and also I got an email from Morton Deutsch, who's at the School Conflict um, Resolution in uh, Colombia, he said that, you know, one thing is that we think of Iran as incorrigible, if we could think of them as corrigible, and that, you know, that sort of gripped by the perceptions. Also, you know, APAC is going to be doing their, their thing um, on sanctions, also as treated, as you often say, and some people that sanction, there's false belief in sanctions that they will work. Um, and also, what about... Um, you know, I'm talking with my colleagues at Mediators Beyond Borders about possibly doing something. Also, what about educating Congress, doing some briefing on the conflict analysis and conflict dynamics? Let's have, we need the question. Right. Okay, well, just, so, you know, what do you think about, you know, uh, ways of reducing, and also, do the Oscars have any effect, influence on the field? The Oscar. The Oscar, too. Okay. Basically, I think the whole pressure on Iran might be good, because in a way, then it will escalate kind of an escalation in the political process might push Iran to decide if it wants to go ahead with the nuclear process program or maybe slow it down. And this could, in a way, maybe could delay or even prevent an Israeli attack. Look okay, the opposite effect. Yes, of course. It's either way. It could be a two edged sword. It's a risk. Uh, Trita, do you want to say anything to this? I'm, I'm okay. We can go to the next question. All right. Well, I've got a lot of people here, some who are friends, but I promise this man. Uh, Trita's leaving at 5.30, so is Ehud, and so am I. I okay. yeah. All right, but Hi. go ahead, and I'll take maybe one more after this. My name is so I don't alienate all everybody out here. My name is Hassan. I was born in Tehran. By looking at the map, as we're looking at Iran and Israel, and uh, as big as Iran is, and the population of 75 million people, 60% under 30 years, very smart people, very friendly with the West, and they are able to protect our interests in that area with no cost. But the cost of our interests being protected by Israel 
every day becomes more and more. So there is a rift in America. How far can we support our friend in Israel, even when we hear that they want to do something without even letting us know, and we support them all the time? Well, Israel is, is not threatening to cut up, uh, to block the head of most traits and all that. And I don't think the uh, United States right now, in the 70s, Iran was an ally of the uh, United States and all kind of an ally of Israel. If you can go back to the 70s, I think Israel will be happy, so the United States, so as many of the Iranian people. But right now, Iran is kind of a problem. And with all the issues the uh, United States has with Israel, Israel is uh, close and uh, has been an ally for the United States for many years. And Iran, it's not exactly an ally in the last few years. Um, can I answer that? I, I think that there, there's a value in what you're saying that we have to have a longer term perspective. Uh, we have seen what happens when we are not taking into consideration the viewpoints of the populations in the region, when we're not taking into consideration um, the hearts and minds of the populations. <coughs> and in the case of the Arab world, the United States is fighting um, at least during the Bush administration, rather unsuccessfully to gain hearts and minds. In Iran, as you pointed out, there isn't, amongst the population, a very strong anti-American sentiment. There is certainly a lot of criticism against the U.S. foreign policy, but it doesn't root itself, as it does in the rest of the region, in a manifestation that is anti-American culture, anti-American people, anti-American values. That, I think, could unfortunately change in a very dramatic way. We don't think through our decisions very carefully, and we go for very short-sighted solutions, um, such as going in militarily. Because I don't foresee there being much more of a reservoir of American soft power in the region in case of a military confrontation between the two countries. All right, we're going to take one more question. We're happy for all of the others who would like to ask them, but we'll take one more back there. Yeah, hi, Jeff Steinberg. The, uh, the statements that have come out of people like General Dempsey, uh, Defense Secretary Panetta, a whole array of American military strategists is not just simply some kind of soft anti-war sentiment, but uh, very clearly this whole potential conflict has been gamed out very thoroughly. And my understanding is that in the vast majority of outcomes that have been considered, this does not uh, stay as a limited war simply involving Iran. There are many, many other dimensions to this, including the fact that U.S. relations with both Russia and China have been badly damaged over Libya, Syria, and um, so I think the U.S. military and clearly many people inside the Israeli institution see the danger of this becoming something much larger. You know, when, when, when Archduke Ferdinand was assassinated, the headlines did not read the next day, World War I starts. These things don't start as obvious. So I'd like to get both of your comments on uh, some of the catastrophic consequences, both economic because of the oil issue, as well as the potential for this becoming a much, much bigger war. Maybe Israel could liberate even the United States kind of a mutual assured destruction between Israel and Iran, and maybe Iran will not use it as people believe uh, that it will be. But uh, of course, it's my, if there will be a nuclear war, nuclear war between Israel and Iran, it will be, I think, worse than any kind of scenario right now if there will be an Israeli attack on Iran or an American attack on Iran, since only, only because it will be a conventional showdown. And I always think, of course, Iran could at least all those uh, slipper cells and proxies and missiles against Israel and all, uh, all hell will break loose. Of course, it will be terrible and also the implication on the oil market and all that. But it's still, it's not as worse as it might be if Iran and Israel will have nukes because, as I said, then Saudi Arabia could have nukes and it could, the entire Middle East could blow up in a massive nuclear showdown that will uh, be much more uh, serious than right now. Trina? I, I respectfully disagree with Ehud on that framing because it essentially says let's have a massive war now so we won't have a massive war later. Um, it, it doesn't make sense to me. I think we're not there. No, it's two bad options. Uh, I don't yeah. think it's not like a support. I just think from Israel point of view there is last resort in the United States that they've seen that there is no way to stop Iran from having a nuclear weapon then the choices of 
have, you are having a nuclear weapon or not, and risking <coughs> a, a war, then maybe sometimes there's But the key word there is last resort. The key yeah, word there yeah. is last resort. We're not even close to anything of last resort. I mean, I said it in a previous setting, um, Iran has a very impressive and mighty arsenal of zero nuclear weapons. <laughs> we need to remind ourselves of that when we're talking about these things, because they're not there. Right now, the White House does not fear a breakout because of the IEA's eyes and ears at the various sites, etc. So we're not close to that type of uh, doomsday decision making. And that's where the problem with the current debate is. Why are we assuming that we are in a much worse situation than we are? Because at that point, we're going to make much more drastic decisions. Right now, we don't have to make those decisions. We can make much wiser decisions. We can expand the decision-making space. We can reduce the hysteria and give ourselves the ability to actually resolve this rather than have to face two bad options, as you mentioned. Thank you all for coming. And let's thank Ehud Ilam and Peter Barth. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.